Lord of Mysteries 2, Circle of Inevitability. Chapter 656, Choosing a Reward. Lumian once again encountered Monsieur Ivaljista, who resided in B-18. He still wore a fluffy black hat adorned with a white feather and a complex black robe. With a quick glance, Lumian had already covertly used weakness investigation to search for pale white marks on Ivaldista's body, ready for potential assassinations and surprise attacks. Auror and Emperor Roselle had always emphasized the need to stay vigilant against others at all times. Of course, Lumian felt that the two of them hadn't done a good job in this matter. Otherwise, they would still be active in the world. At that moment, the pallor on Ivaljista's body concentrated on his dark brown eyes, emitting an illusory quality that seemed unreal. Does this mean he can quickly transform into a wraith, and his eyes are no longer his weakness? As Lumian pondered, he gestured towards the divan in the living room. Let's chat there. Ludwig, seated at the dining table, glanced at Ivalista for a few seconds before lowering his head and continuing his meal with a succulent piece of beef. Ivalgista nodded slightly and entered the living room quietly, taking a seat in a corner of the divan. Are you a student at a primary school? So disciplined. Lumian criticized as he focused on observing Ivalista's luck. It was relatively normal and nothing special. At that moment, Lumian suddenly had a few thoughts. Luck observation and weakness investigation require the eyes to determine the target's color. However, one focuses on the background color, while the other captures the various colors on the surface of the body. When I become a fate appropriator, could these two abilities fuse and mutate into a more special ability? Why can I only use my eyes to observe these two abilities? Is a blind reaper incapable of attacking a target's weakness? Similarly, is a blind ascetic unqualified to observe others' luck? Can't they rely on their spirituality and ears and nose? Or could it be done at a higher sequence? Lumian eased into the armchair, positioning himself at an angle across from Ivalchsta. Flashing a friendly smile, he asked, What's the matter? He spoke in intision. Ivalchsta, as silent as a corpse, straightened up. His eyes, deep as he spoke in ancient Faisak. Allow me to introduce myself. Ivalchta Eggers, a member of the Rose School of Thought and Temperance faction under the Church of the Fool. Lumian's nerves, already tense, heightened. Nevertheless, he maintained a relaxed demeanor, confirming, Are you Twanaku's liaison? He switched to ancient Faisak. No, Ivaljista shook his head, I've already eliminated that member fifteen minutes ago. Fifteen minutes ago, when I was still with the patrol team. However, you can't expect me to believe you just because you say so. Lumian feigned curiosity and asked, I recall that you arrived in Port Pylos before Twanaku was exposed. What was your original motive? I'm investigating the primitive forest in this area. I'm still in the early stages of gathering more information, Ivaljster replied seriously. Four days ago, I came into contact with Twanaku and obtained some information from him. He seemed fine and was very restrained. He's indeed restrained. Otherwise, there wouldn't be a second serial murder case in Port Pylos only after four years, going to the primitive forest to investigate. The primitive forest... On the surface, the incident in Tizimo Town was a sudden attack by a tribe in the primitive forest. Lumian quickly made many connections and said to Ivaljista thoughtfully, Twanaku once did something in Tizimo Town that involved the tribes in the nearby primitive forest. Some of his important items seem to be hidden in Tizimo Town. It might also be related to a noise family demon of unknown sequence. Ivaljista listened in silence, lost in thought. After a few seconds, he said to Lumian, Thank you for providing this information. It might not be useful for my investigation, but it can let me know what to be wary of. He didn't specify his mission. Clearly, he needed his superior's permission. Lumian responded nonchalantly, Even if I don't tell you now, you'll find out tonight or tomorrow. Having already reported the matter to Madame Magician, the Major Arcana cardholder would undoubtedly inform the Church of the Fool and the Temperance faction in detail subsequently. It wouldn't only be a general outline that mentioned key personnel like before. 
Ival Justin nodded with restraint and said, I'm here to express my gratitude and to inform you that we're already investigating any potential problems and latent dangers. Also, if you need help in Mitanni, feel free to come to me. All right. Lumian didn't stand on ceremony. After delving into the more serious matters, Lumian, intrigued, asked Ivalchta, Why did you add the Rose School of Thought prefix when you introduced yourself? You've already left the Rose School of Thought and joined the Church of the Fool. It sounds as if the Rose School of Thought is affiliated with the Church of the Fool. Our leader specifically requested this. She always believes that we are the true Orthodox branch of the Rose School of Thought. Only we represent the Rose School of Thought. Those traitors should change the organization's name, not us, Ivaldusta explained in detail. Sounds quite stubborn. Aren't you from the Temperance faction? Don't you restrain your emotions and desires in this aspect? Yes, Sequence 5 is Wraith, close to evil spirits, and evil spirits have an extreme side. Is this reflected in High Sequence Beyonders of the Temperance faction's corresponding pathway? Lumian didn't quite understand and tried to make a guess based on the available information. He was just chatting and had no intention of inquiring further. Instead, he asked, Your last name is Eggers. Was your ancestor a member of the Balam Empire's royal family? Yes, Ivalchter replied proudly, his emotions held in check. And my mother's lineage is noble from the Highlands Kingdom. For many in the southern continent, the surname Eggers bore unparalleled prestige. It was a symbol of a deity who had once trod the land, a representation of death's dominion over the world. But Lumian's curiosity wandered elsewhere. I've heard that the mausoleums of the Balam Empire's nobles are constructed upside down underground, much like this hotel. What mystical significance does that hold? Is it simply a way to confront death? And why is death associated with the underground? Shouldn't the underworld exist in the spirit world? This was the question that piqued Lumian's interest upon learning about the matter. His understanding of mysticism was limited. Ival just pondered for a moment and then explained, I didn't choose the death pathway. The construction method originated from ancient times, passed down by all the Eggers ancestors devoted to the deity who controlled death. He embodies the very concept of death. Emulating him is a way to approach the source of death. This mystic explanation resonates with me the most. Over the years, I've heard various interpretations. Some see life and death as opposing mystical concepts. They argue that, just as we stand upright and grow upwards in life, burial upside down signifies the contradiction and connection between life and death. Others believe that true hell isn't in the spirit world or the underworld, but deep underground. Descending further symbolizes reaching true hell and returning to the essence of death. Thus, mausoleums are built upside down, reflecting our intention to face hell, worship death, and return to the source. This is the essence and symbol of mysticism. Some beyonders of the death pathway don't really approve of the underworld. Can you discover true hell by delving deep underground? Hehe, <laughs> hasn't anyone informed you that the world we're on is essentially a planet? Does this extension reach underground magma and the core? Do they believe that's the genuine hell? Going deeper will traverse the core and the magma, but that'll merely be the other side of the planet, let alone true hell. Lumian found himself increasingly entertained as he listened. Suddenly, he was taken aback. What exists on the opposite side of the planet? I only know of the northern and southern continents. Considering the time difference, they're nearly on the same side. If this world is genuinely a planet, there must be another side. But I've never heard of any continents just an expansive sea. Wait, how did those giant fellows from the new city of silver emerge from the forsaken land of the gods? Something must have occurred on the continent on the other side of the planet, abandoned by the deities. Could that be why it's known as the Forsaken Land of the Gods? If I have a chance in the future, I could revisit the new city of Silver and explore the library for books related to the Forsaken Land of the Gods. Lumian reigned in his thoughts and continued conversing with Ivaldista for a while. Eventually, he escorted the former descendant of the Balam Empire's royal family, 
a member of the temperance faction, away from this floor. Not long after returning to his room, the doll messenger arrived with a response from Madame Magician. The information and insights you've gathered this time are exceptionally valuable. It's no wonder my spiritual perception guided me to let you visit the new city of Silver after the Hanth Island Demon Incident. Reflecting on it, your encounter with Nabor Disley seemed almost coincidental. You followed the clues to Hanth Island. Hmm, you should grasp the significance, right? The situation in this matter both reassures me and intensifies my vigilance and anxiety. When that entity stands by our side, these details are incredibly useful. However, he won't always be with us. When our objectives clash, I can't fathom what challenges we'll face. The same goes for you and me. Therefore, hunters must rely more on their personal growth amidst blood, fire, chaos, and conflict. Many hunters meet their end, using their bones to forge the Red Priest who conquers all. We've already initiated an internal review. It involves a considerable number of individuals and will take a substantial amount of time to complete. Considering your contributions, besides converting the Bayonder characteristic into a sealed artifact, you have the option to choose a reward. Pick one out of two. Here are your choices. 1. The Potion Formula for the Hunter Pathways Sequence 4 Iron Blooded Knight. 2. I'll assist you in divining clues about the remaining parts of the abscessed hand's body. Chapter 657, Tizimo Town Reading Madame Magician's two choices, Lumian fell into deep thought. These were incredible rewards. It had to be known that reaching sequence 4 marked a crucial point for Bayonders, a moment of qualitative transformation. From then on, one could attain godhood and become a half-human, half-god entity. Most Bayonders would never get this far. This wasn't just about becoming a demigod. It also included seeing or obtaining related items firsthand. A Sequence 4 Potion formula was usually priceless. Moreover, this was a Sequence 4 Potion formula related to Lumian's own pathway. As for the reward of divining clues about the rest of the abscessed hand's body, it symbolized the promise and assistance of an angel. Ordinary Bayonders wouldn't even dream of such a chance, let alone receive an opportunity. They could only read about angels gaining the Lord's permission and responding to believers' prayers in various churches. Furthermore, Lumian needed to address this issue. After advancing to a Sequence 5 Reaper, his top priority was finding the remaining parts of the abscessed hand's body. Without completing this task, the formula, the ingredients, the digestion process, and the prepared ritual wouldn't give him a shot at becoming a demigod in time due to the unfulfilled promise and the oath's restrictions. Regret wouldn't even be an option. Lumian had no clue how to locate it by himself. His only plan was to mimic the incantation for summoning the abscessed hand and craft a new series of summoning incantations. He hoped to summon the spirit world creature's legs, arms, body, and head. However, this was a risky endeavor. In his dream, Lumian learned from his sister that when the summoning incantation lacked clarity and had no restrictions, the summoned entity could be unpredictable. It might be a demigod-level spirit world creature filled with malice, capable of killing the summoner instantly. Lumian couldn't pinpoint the precise direction due to the unknown fragmentation of the abscessed hand's body. It could be a relatively intact body missing a hand, or it might have shattered into tiny, peanut-sized fragments. Describing it accurately was impossible. He could only experiment repeatedly, narrowing down the possibilities. It was akin to playing with his life. More importantly, Lumian had already combed through the comprehensive information on common spirit world creatures provided by Madame Magician. Still, he found nothing that seemed to be other parts of the abscessed hand's body. Lumian desired the sequence four iron blooded night potion formula and clues about the rest of the abscessed hand's body. This was the reason why he couldn't make a decision. He pondered whether to teleport back to Trier now and seek Franca or Jenna's help in divination, hoping their spiritual insights would provide him with valuable hints. As these thoughts raced through his mind, Lumian reached a decision. The second option. This was because he remembered something important. Mr. Hanged Man's reward had yet to materialize. 
it was an opportunity to explore the Blue Avenger, a ghost ship that was a relic of the Tudor Empire. Considering that the Blood Emperor Alice the Tudor was once a true god of the Hunter Pathway and a half-mad Red Priest, the Tudor Empire's inheritance contained the Sequence 4 Potion formula of the Hunter Pathway, along with Bayonder ingredients and characteristics. It was something to look forward to. Lumion promptly sat down and penned a reply to Madame Magician, expressing his thoughts. He also informed her that he would be heading to Tizimo Town to investigate Hisoka's inheritance. At 4 p.m., Camus Castilla, accompanied by three dark brown southern continent natives, knocked on the door of Suite 7 on B3 of Hotel Arella. They all hail from Tizimo, born and bred. They only ventured to Port Pylos in search of opportunities upon reaching adulthood, Camus explained in Intision, introducing the two men and one woman. One is a supplier of guadar berries, another married a local and toils at the port, and the third took a less lawful path as a thief. One is a relatively wealthy merchant, the other is a dock worker, and the other is a thief. They happen to be at three different social levels, and they are from both genders. This will allow me to understand the situation in Tizimo to the greatest extent and comprehensively. Camus is very professional in this aspect. As expected of a former public security officer, Lumian nodded slightly and asked the three subjects in fluent Dutonese, I'm a scholar of folklore en route to Tizimo, but before that I'd like to learn more about the town. My Dutonese is a bit rusty, so Mr. Camus will assist in translation. We'll heed Officer Camus, responded the eldest merchant with a smile, quickly seconded by the others. Lumian turned to Lugano and instructed, I'll take one to the master bedroom for an exchange. You can entertain the other two. All right, Lugano replied promptly. Inside the master bedroom, Lumian courteously seated the merchant in an armchair, positioning himself at the edge of the bed. Speaking in intision, he inquired, What's the primary produce of Tizimo? Camus, translating, wore a puzzled expression. Is Louis Berry truly planning a journey to Tizimo? It's evident he's tracing Twanaku's footsteps. Camus assumed the role of an interrogator, staring down at the seated merchant as he conveyed Lumian's words. The merchant, filled with trepidation, responded, Sir, we mainly cultivate guadar berries, spices, and forest fruits. Numerous plantations dot the surroundings, and we often venture into the forest for hunting, selling both meat and fur. Additionally, we cut down trees for crafting coffins. That's, that's about it. The remaining effort goes into planting corn and potatoes for our own consumption. Lumian absorbed the information and refined his understanding of Dutonese through Camus's translation. Engaging in casual conversation, Lumian explored the daily lives, sustenance, and leisure activities of the Tizimo residents. From the merchant's account, Lumian painted a mental picture of Tizimo. Its populace mainly consisted of locals, with outsiders being the proprietors of nearby plantations and some acquired slaves. Thanks to the hunting services provided to the Port Pilos gentry, Tizimo maintained a connection with the outside world, avoiding isolation and conservatism. Although the faith in death had been eradicated, traces of it lingered in daily life. The townspeople primarily believed in the eternal blazing sun, yet remnants of death faith were evident, such as frequent visits to the cemetery and the practice of not burying prematurely deceased children in coffins. Each adult prepared a coffin for themselves in advance, and the common means of travel involved using a coffin. With keen interest, Lumian concluded the discussion and inquired, Are you familiar with Twanaku Tupion? Finally getting into the meat, Camus exhaled quietly and conveyed the question to the merchant. A warm smile appeared on the merchant's face. I do, he's well known in town. Why? Camus interjected. The merchant, with an obsequious smile, responded, Sir, he should be your colleague. Twanaku is the first person from Tizimo to join the patrol team. Moreover, he's rapidly advancing in rank. He's a source of pride for us. Lumian couldn't help but emit a soft chuckle. I'm quite curious about Twanaku's past. The merchant's expression shifted slightly as he glanced around. 
Sirs, did Twanaku commit a crime? Did he join an organization that believes in death? Quite perceptive. Lumian thought, while Camus grumbled in a low voice, Are we doing the questioning, or are you? Just answer truthfully. Under the mental pressure of the interrogator, the dark. Skinned merchant replied with a trembling voice, I've known for a long time that this young man Twanaku will surely become extraordinary, but I also know he'll one day tread the path of blasphemy against the deity. Seeing Camus and Lumian awaiting further explanation, the merchant continued, There was a fire in the Twanaku family. All his kin perished, and only he survived. According to our customs, he's favored by a deity spared from death. Such individuals often go on to achieve great feats. The deity's favor refers to death here, right? Not succumbing to death is considered receiving death's favor. Lumian interjected thoughtfully. The fire happened about six years ago. How did you know? The surprised merchant asked. Then, slapping his forehead, he added, I'm such a fool. You must have investigated it beforehand. From the looks of it, the fire somehow brought Twanaku back to life, transforming him into Hisoka. Lumian nodded. Continue. Recalling, the merchant said, Since then, Twanaku fell silent, as if in shock. He no longer participated in Mass or entered the Cathedral of God. Later, he left Tizimo for Port Pylos. Was Twanaku unafraid of scrutiny for acting so unusually? Did he not bother to feign his faith? By then, Hisoka had already become a bayonder of the Devil Pathway, making it impossible for him to participate in the Eternal Blazing Sun Church's Mass. Where did his first potion come from? Lumian pondered while Camus translated and asked, Does Twanaku frequently return to Tizimo? He comes back to Tizimo every year. I'm not sure how often or for how long, the merchant truthfully replied. Where does he stay when he returns to Tizimo? Lumian inquired further. The merchant smoothly replied, at his own place. After joining the patrol team and amassing wealth, he rebuilt the burnt-down house. Rebuilt the house that was destroyed in the fire. Lumian contemplated for a moment and then asked, Are there any special folklore festivals in Tizimo? Chapter 658 Deep Desire The merchant responded cautiously to Camus's translation, Sir, we don't really have any special folklore festivals. We only celebrate two festivals every year. One is the Sun Sacrifice in December, and the other is the New Sun Festival in June. The Sun Sacrifice was a recurring festival for the eternal blazing Sun Church, marking the day with the longest daylight of the year when the sun reached its zenith at noon. In the northern continent, it took place in mid to late June, while in the southern continent, due to the reverse seasons, it occurred in mid to late December. The new Sun Festival, originating from the believers of the southern continent's eternal blazing sun, involved celebrations during the longest night and shortest days, welcoming the return of the sun and anticipating more light and warmer weather. This celebration often coincided with the new year in many parts of the southern continent, gradually merging the two festivities. The merchant explained that the citizens of Tizimo town solely celebrated festivals connected to the eternal blazing sun, having abandoned the traditions related to death. He reflected for a moment and added, It's been like this for a long time since my grandfather was born. Matani, particularly Port Pylos and the gold mine city of Devise, had been in Tiz's colony for nearly a century. The native population was compelled to convert generations ago, becoming followers of the eternal blazing sun. This, however, was limited to areas effectively managed by colonial institutions in the past. When Lumian arrived in Port Pylos, his first impression was, at the docks in the heart of the city, it resembled the port cities of Antis. Yet, the workers' skin was darker and browner. The streets frequented by Antisians and Phanopaterians were sparsely populated and desolate. After passing Hotel Orella and exploring other areas of Port Pylos, various buildings with West Balam characteristics emerged. More pedestrians populated the streets, and the echoes of Dutanese filled the air. Lumian sought further details, indirectly confirming the merchant's words. 
interrogator Camus discerned no signs of deception. What things have left a deep impression on you since you were young that you still remember from time to time? Lumian shifted the conversation. Recalling, the merchant replied, Grand funerals, newly built coffins, the primitive tribe that clashes with us every year, the occasional scream at night because of them. Everyone's hardworking, calm, and well-educated. We get angry, but we don't argue on the spot or shout. We choose to find the padre, officers, and judges to determine who's right and who's wrong. Camus translated the merchant's words to Lumian, adding a few comments. That's indeed the case. I've been to Tizimo. The people there are very docile. Even if they're treated unfairly, they rarely resist violently. The manor owners of the surrounding plantations love to hire them, reducing the cost of buying slaves. Of course, it's not that they're emotionless and won't resist. Instead, they tend to abide by order and follow the official processes to resolve problems. I, I guess they can be considered outstanding believers of the eternal blazing sun. The honorific name of the eternal blazing sun contained the description embodiment of order. As a member of the Fainapata royal lineage, Camus undoubtedly believed in the Earth Mother. He knew that Louis Berry hailed from the Antis Republic and was likely a believer of the eternal blazing sun. Lumian stood up, extending his arms with a smile. Praise the sun. Praise the sun. The merchant hastily followed suit. Lumian settled back into his seat, contemplating for a few fleeting moments. Have you experienced any strange dreams? The merchant nodded, then shook his head. Many, but they slip away from memory. Do you not encounter such dreams? Indeed, dreams often elude the control of one's consciousness. They can reveal spiritual insights, mirror suppressed desires, or reflect events from the day. Sometimes, these elements intertwine, resulting in strange and unpredictable dreams. I, too, frequently encounter such dreams. In the past, when I battled the demon corruption, they were even more bizarre and exaggerated. Lumian sensed that the merchant's response was impeccable. If the other party could pinpoint a specific strange dream that might raise suspicion, either the dream was exceptionally strange and unforgettable, or the merchant was abnormal and had prepared in advance before coming. After discussing other matters, Lumian escorted the merchant out of the master bedroom. The responses of the other two Tizimans were similar to the merchants, only supplementing the details they observed at their level and sharing encounters with their own characteristics. Lumian found no traces of the Dream Festival. If the Dream Festival is genuinely linked to Tizimo, there's only one possibility. When the townsfolk fall asleep, they enter a dream world to celebrate the festival. Upon waking, they forget everything. Or there's another possibility. Two factions may be involved in Hisoka's Tizimo town prank. First, the citizens of Tizimo. Second, the primitive tribe in the nearby forest. Could the Dream Festival be a celebration for that primitive tribe? Hisoka's prank impacted the Dream Festival, leading the primitive tribe to suddenly attack Tizimo, resulting in significant casualties and concealing the traces of his advancement ritual to desire apostle. Lumian pondered as he walked Camus and the three Tizimans to the door. Upon returning to the master bedroom, he stood before the desk and gazed at the stone wall in front of him. His eyes flickered with anticipation and unease. His decision to stay in the southern continent and actively pursue Hisoka's inheritance was indeed to grow amid blood, fire, chaos, and conflict, securing more acting opportunities. He aimed to open the door to godhood and advance to sequence four as soon as possible. The reason for his impatience was, he saw a glimmer of hope in reviving his sister. The state of the Nabordisleys on Hanth Island provided him with that glimmer of hope. This hope stemmed from the belief that a high-ranking figure of the Earth Mother Church might possess the ability to divide another person's soul. This would allow each soul fragment to grow into a relatively separate individual through rebirth. Aurora's soul fragment was sealed within Lumian's body. Perhaps a high-ranking member of the Church of Earth Mother could use one or more soul fragments to resurrect Auror in a new form. Lumian wasn't certain if such a plan could be realized or if it constituted true resurrection, 
but it was the most plausible method he had encountered so far. He was determined to give it a try. Of course, he couldn't experiment with Auror's soul fragment directly. His plan was to deliberately create some soul fragments in future cullings and seek help from the Church of Earth Mother to see if they could be reborn and if the person who returned was the same individual. Once all the details were confirmed, he would revive Auror. Lumion didn't believe he had the qualifications to collaborate with the Church of Earth Mother. Only by becoming a demigod and relying on the secret organization, the Tarot Club, could he gain the Church of Earth Mother's attention and fulfill the transaction conditions proposed by the other party. For this, Lumion couldn't wait to obtain godhood and advance to Sequence 4. At times, Lumion wished his sister were also a blessed of celestial worthy and had inherited the ancient castle. This way, her resurrection might be more straightforward. Yes, to extract Auror's soul fragment, I must undo Mr. Prinafool's seal. To undo his seal, I have to wait for Termoboros to become very weak. For Termoboros to weaken, I need to continuously extract his power at a higher level. And to withstand the power of a higher level, I have to possess godhood and advance step by step. Lumian's thoughts gradually clarified, and he unprecedentedly yearned for an advancement. Trier, Courtier de la Cathedrale Commemorative, Apartment 702, 9 Rue Orisai. Franca lay on the bed beneath a velvet blanket, her cheeks still flushed, eyes moist, and her expression unusually complicated. Beside her, Jenna rested under the same velvet cover. She had slipped into a deep slumber, her brows furrowed with a mix of exhaustion, satisfaction, resistance and nostalgia. Her outstretched arms and exposed fair skin still bore traces of the recent fervor. Franca gazed at Jenna and let out a sudden sigh. The experience had exceeded her expectations, yet a sense of emptiness lingered in her heart. It was beautiful in the moment, but what would transpire after the digestion of the pleasure potion? Could physical intimacy and emotional distance coexist? Did overwhelming pleasure pave the way for sorrow? Was it the agony of sinking into oblivion while resisting salvation? Sigh, Franker released another soft sigh. She sensed that her pleasure potion had been substantially digested. Matani State, Port Pylos. Lumion, sipping a glass of Guadar, looked up and spoke to Lugano as if discussing the weather. We're heading to Tizimo Town today. Will you join Ludwig and me, or will you stay here and wait for us? Let me warn you in advance. The situation in Tizimo Town might be very dangerous. Very dangerous. He wanted to say he'd stay in Port Pylos, but memories of Father Montserrat flashed in his mind. Gritting his teeth, he replied, I'm with you. If danger lurked in Tizimo Town, he could rely on his boss to bail him out. But here, only himself. Lumian nodded slightly and didn't say more. After checking out and hitting the street, he chuckled at Lugano and Ludwig, do we take a coffin to Tizimo or should we grab a carriage? Before Lugano and Ludwig could answer, a four-wheeled, four-seater carriage rolled up from under the shade. The carriage's driver, a young man, kept his head low, not daring to look away. Coming to a stop, Camus Castia emerged. He forced a smile and said to Lumian, Thanks for your help these past days. I'll escort you to Tizimo. Chapter 659 Poor Monster Observing Camus's expression, as if compelled to act at gunpoint, Lumian didn't hold back. He replied with a smile, I'd like that. It was evident to him that the brass of the patrol team, or even Admiral Quirrell himself, was concerned about Louis Berry wandering around their territory. Tizimo, where he was headed, was located near the primitive forest and had close ties to a Sequence 5 Desire Apostle. Therefore, two additional patrol team members with a certain relationship with Louis Berry were sent to accompany him. Even if they couldn't prevent trouble, they could at least send word before it became a catastrophe. As for why they didn't directly stop Louis Berry from heading to Tizimo Town, it was partly because Lumian had hinted at the faction backing him when he submitted Twanaku's head. Without a conflict of principles, Admiral Quirrell likely wouldn't make things difficult for him. 
Secondly, Louis Berry's investigations and adventures seemed to bring calamity, but they had exposed hidden dangers ahead of time. If the problem remained concealed and continued to evolve, Matani and Admiral Quirrell might not be able to handle it in a year or two. When the time came, blood might flow like a river. Colobo, acting as the carriage driver, gazed ahead stonily. He fumbled for a pair of sunglasses and slid them onto the bridge of his nose. There were no visible injuries on his body. As Camus held the carriage door open, he watched Louis Berry board, leading a young boy by the hand. He's going to Tizimo too? Camus blurted in surprise. He had assumed Louis Berry would leave his servant and godson at Hotel Orella, joining them later after dealing with Tizimo Town's issues. However, the adventurer was now bringing a young child to Tizimo, and it was evident this wasn't a leisurely trip. It was very dangerous. Lumian's left foot remained on the ground, and his right foot halted at the carriage's edge. He smiled and spoke, My godson is fascinated by jungle fruits, the unique beasts I hunt, and various spices. Earlier, the Tizimans had mentioned their hometown specialties, highlighting the excellence of roasted meat. The blend of spices and the distinctive gamey flavor of wild beasts in the forest contributed to Tizimo Town's unique delicacies. Ludwig, already settled in the carriage, swallowed, seemingly in sync with Lumian. Aren't you worried about endangering your godson? Why are you so confident? Camus didn't press, simply signaling Lugano with his eyes to hurry up. Lugano cast a glance at the peculiar carriage driver, who trembled slightly beneath his black sunglasses. He entered the carriage and took a seat across from Lumian and Ludwig. Camus shut the carriage door and settled beside Colobo. With a sigh, he remarked, You can remove your sunglasses now. It's been hard on you. All right, all right, all right. Colobo seemed to shiver as if struck by an icy wind. His teeth chattered and his tremors intensified. Camus turned to him, surprised. Didn't you strike a deal face to face with Louis Berry? Why are you still so afraid? Not seeing him directly again. All right, all right, all right. Colobo removed his sunglasses, taking more than ten seconds to compose himself. In a hushed tone, he confessed with fear, I feel like my fingers, my arms, my insides, even my head, all eaten. That, that, that what? Camus struggled to comprehend why the monster's demeanor had shifted so drastically, sensing that the issue might be significant. Colobo swallowed hard and continued, That, that child, is also very dangerous. Though I haven't laid eyes on him, I sense a looming threat, like facing a lion, a tiger, a python, ready to eat me at any moment. Camus was stunned, a hiss escaping his lips. Until now, Colobo had never exhibited such fear except in the presence of three individuals radiating danger. Desire Apostle Twanaku with wraith powers and Louis Berry capable of hunting Twanaku. Could this boy match them? Is he also a Bayonder, perhaps a Sequence 5 Bayonder? No, it's not merely a Sequence 5 matter. Our patrol team's captain is a Sequence 5, yet Colobo never mentioned feeling such foreboding in his presence. There must be something unique about these three individuals. Regardless, the boy is undoubtedly extraordinary and hazardous. No wonder Louis Berry is bringing his godson to Tizimo without worry. Perhaps the child poses an even greater threat. Camus unraveled his earlier confusion, stifling his curiosity, refraining from probing further with Colobo. In the confines of the four-wheeled carriage, even with the barrier between them, Louis Berry caught wind of their hushed exchange. Considering the intel gleaned from the fog sea, Camus harbored suspicions that Louis Berry was a sequence five bayonder following the hunter pathway. Those of this pathway were renowned for their sharp senses, exceptional vision, acute sense of smell, and keen hearing. A bayonder of the monster pathway is quite intriguing. Even without laying eyes on Ludwig or hearing his voice, Louis can sense his ominous aura a being who devours everything. Lumian, leaning against the carriage wall, toyed with his golden straw hat, shooting Ludwig a knowing smile. Could it be that this little child has truly taken a liking to Colobo and Camus? Indeed. These are two Bayonders who haven't succumbed to severe corruption. 
Ludwig likely had a momentary lapse in control. Ha <laughs> ha, Camus may not have noticed, but Colobo reacted instantly, sensing the danger. Lumian acknowledged Ludwig with a nod. Well done. Your restraint is admirable. Praise was due when a child behaved correctly, fostering a healthy mindset and habits. Ludwig remained silent, his expression conveying he was not to be treated as a child. A faint smile graced his lips as he retrieved a box of biscuits from his crimson school bag, nibbling on them. What restraint? What did he mean by, well done? Lugano, seated across from him, found himself perplexed. Tizimo stood as the most remote town in Port Pilos, nestled against the edge of the primitive forest. A full two hours' journey by carriage was required to reach it. Of course, for those in a hurry, an alternative route existed, boarding a steam locomotive from the port to Kehert, the southernmost town. From there, a carriage or coffin could be hired to venture northeast, shaving the travel time to Tizimo down to just an hour. However, Lumian showed no inclination towards haste. As they departed Port Pilos, the road gradually narrowed and deteriorated. Yet, the carriage pressed on steadily. Colobo, the carriage driver, operated with precision akin to a well-oiled machine, guiding the horses and carriage without falter. An hour slipped by, and the carriage wound its way through the forest. Abruptly, Lumian, pretending to slumber, snapped open his eyes. His body turned dark and spectral, melding with the shadows cast by the window. Shadow transformation. In an instant, gunshots pierced the forest's tranquility. Bullets whizzed from afar, some thudding into the earth, kicking up clouds of soil, while others took aim at Camus, the carriage, and the horse. Amidst the chaos, the horse crumpled, bleeding profusely, and the carriage toppled to the ground. Colobo had already abandoned his perch as the driver, escaping unscathed from the barrage of gunfire. Camus leaped clear of the carriage in advance, crouching low, revolver in hand. He maneuvered with agility, at times rolling at others slithering deeper into the undergrowth. With each movement, he unleashed shots, seeking to suppress the unseen assailant. In this range, many of his abilities were restricted. A handful of fiery crimson orbs, almost blindingly white, streaked past Camus, disappearing into the forest's depths. Rumble. Amidst the thunderous explosions, the gunfire abruptly ceased. Soon after, curses and dutinies rang out from the forest's depths. Go to hell, you northern continent bandits, rot with your sons of bitches. Come after us if you have the guts. Gradually, the curses faded into the forest's depths. Lumian emerged from the shadows of the carriage, opting not to pursue. It's the resistance. What are they doing in Matani? Camus frowned, muttering to himself in confusion. In the southern continent, numerous resistance factions abounded. He couldn't discern which faction they belonged to or their motives. Typically, Matani, ostensibly independent from the Antis Republic and governed by Admiral Quirrell, a southern continent native, saw little resistance activity. Their primary demand was the expulsion of colonists. Could it be a faction of the resistance dedicated to death, aiming to revive death's influence in Matani? Please not the Rose School of Thought-Backed Resistance. No, those lunatics. Camus returned to the carriage, puzzled. Lumian mulled over another matter. Despite attaining Sequence 5 status, life still felt fragile vulnerable to being shot dead. If a resistance member possessed sharpshooting skills and remained beyond his observational range, sniping from over 100 meters, they could have ended his life. Reapers lacked the resilient bodies of devils. While lacking malicious perception, devils might sustain only minor wounds from rifle shots. Their absence of long-range danger premonition characteristic of seer pathways rendered them unable to preemptively evade. Granted, Lumian's ascetic traits bolstered his spiritual perception. Anticipating danger, he had foreseen the attack. Yet, if the adversary could nullify his spiritual perception or manipulate it effectively, conventional rifles could indeed imperil Lumian. Yes, shadow transformation can serve as a shield. Bullets lacking special effects pose no genuine threat to shadow beings. Lumian redirected his thoughts, instructing Lugano, emerging from the carriage, check on the horse. 
if it survived, attend to its injuries promptly for carriage duty. If not, Ludwig would command the equine corpse to pull the carriage. After all, Ludwig had gained the ability to command a handful of low-level, undead from a concoction brewed from Hisoka's eyeballs. Chapter 660, Across the Door Without hesitation, Lugano pushed himself up and hurried to the fallen horse, carefully examining it. After a few seconds, he exclaimed regretfully, It's dead. The poor horse was unlucky. Despite being over a hundred meters away, it was hit twice by a flurry of gunshots. One bullet struck its side and the other hit its head. It couldn't be any more dead. In contrast, the carriage driver remained unscathed. At most, he had scraped his skin during the tumble. Lumian glanced at Kolobo, who had his back turned to him and the others, seemingly on guard against any potential attacks from the depths of the forest. He led Ludwig, who had been thrown from the carriage, to the side of the motionless, bleeding horse corpse. Stop the bleeding, Lumian instructed Lugano. Why stop it when the horse is already dead? Although Lugano didn't understand, he extended his shimmering palm. After the dead horse's wounds closed, Lumian turned to Ludwig and said, Your turn. Ludwig, dressed in a child's formal attire, nodded slightly. He extended his right palm, gripping the dead horse with his five fingers, and slowly raised it. The blood-stained corpse of the horse suddenly stood up, causing the overturned carriage to shift slightly. Upon seeing this, Camus gave a barely perceptible nod. Is this child from the death pathway or the prisoner pathway? However, there's no cold aura or corpse-like aura. After Lugano righted the carriage, the undead horse corpse continued pulling the five of them towards Tizimo. Just before noon, Lumian spotted their destination. It was a small town half encircled by rubber trees, acacia trees, laurels, and other vegetation. Several plantations dotted the muddy road, and the air was filled with different spice scents and the alluring smell of roasted meat. Tizimo's buildings were unique. Apart from the eternal blazing Sun Church Cathedral, which had a distinct northern style, the rest were propped up by wooden stakes and stone pillars. They were reminiscent of West Balham, the base deliberately left empty underneath. This was due to the humid air and abundant rainfall in many West Balham areas. Water would often overflow and pool below. Lumian climbed down from the four-wheeled, four-seater carriage, watching the people busy with their tasks in the plantation and the town. Trier, Courtier de la Cathedrale Commemorative, Apartment 702, 9 Rue Orisai. Franker reclined in the recliner, rocking gently as she recollected the previous day's events. After Jenna woke up that morning, she went out to the streets to buy meat, vegetables, fruits, and bread, making Franca wonder if she had experienced a wet dream or hallucination. Why did she suddenly volunteer to help me with digesting the potion? Compared to most Tririans, she can definitely be considered conservative. Moreover, she was so direct and straightforward that I almost lost my desires out of shock. Shouldn't she flirt first to set the mood? When the time comes, even if she doesn't initiate, I won't be able to control myself. The more Franca thought about it, the more puzzled she became. She felt Jenna wouldn't normally act that way. After recalling Jenna's past experiences and actions, she realized there was no issue. That was precisely what Jenna would do. Jenna has a bold nature, or rather, a personality that allows her to act decisively. After the showy diva singer who helped her was raped by Margaret and became unstable, she was truly willing to go to extremes to assassinate Margaret and avenge her friend. To that end, she even indebted herself to me for the assassin potion and firmly became a bayonder despite her finances. At the Hughes Artois banquet, she faced the member of parliament protected by official bayonders and evil gods' minions. She risked everything, disregarding her own fate. She killed the bastard who brought catastrophe to the market district and her family on the spot. In her heart, I should still be more important than that showy diva friend of hers. Suddenly going to extremes and offering to help me with the potion's effects is indeed something she would do. Besides, sigh, this definitely isn't a spur-of-the-moment idea. 
She has asked me several times about my progress digesting the pleasure potion and if I have a new partner. She even recommended Lumion. Realizing that I haven't found a new partner and that I'm only open-minded outwardly, she decided to act after being stirred by Lumion advancing to sequence 5 yesterday. That doesn't seem enough reason Jenna wouldn't sacrifice her body because of just those things? Sigh, sacrifice. Could it be that she had long realized I secretly liked her and didn't seek out a new partner because of her? Could she believe she affected my digesting the pleasure potion, causing her to act? Yes, that must be it. That's the only way she'd truly go to such extremes. Ah, why can't I find any hint of romantic love? Franca wailed inwardly. If she had known this would happen, she would have summoned her courage, toughened her resolve, and sought Lumian's help. That way, she wouldn't feel as conflicted and pained as she did now. Of course, she didn't seek out a new intimate partner partly because she cared about Jenna's opinion. She had become Gardner Martin's lover and shared his other lovers before meeting Jenna. There was no changing that history, so she continued on. After Gardner Martin's demise, she had claimed she wanted Browns to experience true pleasure and participate in the demoness's female orgies, but most of it was just talk. She was filled with anticipation only out of novelty. If Browns suddenly agreed, she might hesitate and make excuses. She didn't want to leave an unrestrained image in Jenna or Lumian's minds. To put it simply, her answer to the question, Is there really no one in this world you care about? had changed, so she was hesitant to actively pursue a new intimate partner. Jenna had no substantial intimate experience, so she didn't know how to set a mood for such situations. She could only revert to the straightforward seduction from when she was little minx, but she didn't want to deceive my feelings and make me fall deeper. That's why she acted that way yesterday. Thankfully, she's relatively level-headed. She didn't seek a lover to make me give up allowing me to truly find a new intimate partner. Yes, she might think that would be giving me prolonged pain and not prolonged pleasure. It would have hindered my digestion of the potion. Franca felt even more dejected after piecing together the entire situation. On the stairs leading to apartment 702, Jenna held a bag of bread and a basket of beef, vegetables and fruits, reluctant to go back inside. Recalling yesterday's events made her blush, unsure of how to face Franca. In her previous days as a showy diva singer, she had witnessed others' affection and felt it was just so-so. Although exciting, she thought she could endure it. Unexpectedly, after experiencing it for real, she realized pleasure could make people become consumed by it. Phew. Jenna took a few deep breaths to calm herself. What troubled her now was how to interact with Franca. Wait, should I pretend nothing happened and face her with my usual demeanor? Should I be more cheerful and take the initiative to mention yesterday, pretending it's no big deal so Franca doesn't mind? But won't this upset her? She needs to digest the pleasure potion. Besides, one pleasure encounter is definitely not enough. I have to spend time with her as a couple. Should I keep seducing her tonight like yesterday or wait for her to initiate? Damn it, how annoying. Jenna found such matters more vexing than assassinating powerful figures. Whether avenging herself on Margaret or killing Hugh's Artois, she had always felt death was the worst outcome no big deal. However, this situation clearly hadn't reached life or death stakes. The subsequent troubles would linger. Jenna couldn't help but feel frustrated at the thought of maintaining an intimate physical relationship with Franca and all the complexities involved. She wished she could simply assassinate the Minister of Industry, Morin Avigny, instead. Taking deep breaths to steady her emotions, Jenna analyzed how to approach this from an actress's perspective to make Franca more accepting of future intimacies. She had already taken the first bold step. She definitely wasn't willing to give up now. She planned to continue their relationship until Franca finished digesting the pleasure potion's effects. After figuring out her next move, Jenna's lips curled into a faint smile. Carrying bread and ingredients, she briskly climbed the stairs and returned to apartment 702. As soon as she opened the door, Franca jumped up from the recliner instinctively and forced a smile. 
she said nervously, you're back? Amused by Franca's actions, Jenna chuckled and sighed inwardly. How great would it be if you didn't want to become lovers? Jenna calmly walked to the dining table and placed her items on it. Then she glared at Franca. What are you waiting for? Help me. All right, all right. Franca hurried over. Seeing that Jenna wasn't reserved or distant, nor reverted to her usual demeanor, she felt an inexplicable relief. She even began to anticipate the night's arrival. Sizzle, sizzle. The juices from a piece of beef dripped onto the fire, transforming into smoke that swirled upwards, blending with the aroma of spices. This caused Ludwig to swallow a few mouthfuls of saliva. However, the boy patiently waited, not rushing the cook until the beef roasted to its optimal state. Lumian turned his body and gazed at a three-story building diagonally across from the restaurant. The yellowish-brown house was the former residence rebuilt by Hisoka Twinaku.